Hello and welcome to another fantastic audio tutorial. My name is Dave Bodie for Tuts Plus, and thanks so much for checking out this video. This is a continuation in our producing an EP series, and in this video, we're going to be checking out some arrangement ideas. Specifically, what I did to one of these tracks that we're working on in this six song EP to help build it out and fill out the instrumentation and orchestration. This particular song, is Set of Fire, and it was written by Michael Ost, who also sings it. And in one of the first videos, I believe we looked at a very little bit of the scratch track, but in case you missed that, let me play a little bit of the scratch track just to give you an idea of where we started from. Two, three, four. Day after day as I wait So, that's basically what we started with that got emailed to me, and I think they recorded that on an iPhone or some kind of computer, something with a crummy microphone, and uh, I just add a little bit of EQ and compression to help make it suitable for my ears because it was a little rough sounding. Anyway, so we used that as a reference and kind of built out this track. Now, the group that I'm working with called Patmos had a little bit of direction for this song. They knew that they wanted an acoustic guitar element. They had this idea of this finger picked guitar pattern in there, and also some more strummy guitar stuff as it built in the latter half of this song. And they also knew that they wanted some big drums to come in as well towards the end of this song. So that's right here. And they also were pretty sure that this song could use some pads. But other than that, other than those acoustic guitar tracks and the idea of some big drums throughout the bridge, that's pretty much all the direction that I got for this. And then I essentially just kind of built this out how I saw fit and it worked pretty well. So I want to take you through a little bit of what we did to fix it up and make it really nice sounding. So before we jump in and check out some of the individual pieces, let me play it down for you so you can check out what the whole thing sounds like. Give me a love for more 
This track isn't 100% finished. There are a few things that still need some minor adjustment, and I'm sure any eagle-eared listener will have noticed that. I noticed right at the end, I heard some really strange extraneous noises from the acoustic guitars, maybe? Yeah, there it is. I think it's this guy. Nope. There we go. Let's see if we can fade that out. Little chair shift in there. Yeah, it's not, it's not terrible. Uh, I suppose that we could swap that guy out for this one, maybe. Because that one's probably a little bit cleaner. Let's check that out. Yeah, it's not bad. And because the intensity is supposed to be down here, I'll just pull it down. There's a couple of little weird, strange anomalies in there. But um, like I said, this is one of those projects where we can't spend forever on each song. You know, a lot of the work in you know, making these songs sound good comes in on the post-production side of things. We don't have a tremendous amount of time laboring over every guitar chord, you know, because there isn't room in the budget for this project. In fact, most of the vocal take that you're hearing is the first take that Michael sang through with a couple of pieces punched in here and there from some other takes. But I think he only did three run-throughs of it. I mean, literally, that's all we had time for for this particular track. So if we check out what's going on with some of the rhythm portions of this song, we have a couple of things going on. One is I knew I wanted some kind of rhythmical element, some kind of percussive element throughout the entire piece to kind of drive it. Because honestly, it's a pretty long time to wait, you know, three minutes and 15 seconds before the drums kick in. So I wanted some shaker in there. I thought that would be pretty good, but I didn't want a constant 16th note shaker pattern because I thought that would be busy and boring. So what I did instead is I used this shaker virtual instrument here that I built, this multi-sampled instrument. And for more information on this, you can check out a tutorial that I did on how I made this shaker sample on Tuts Plus. And this is using all samples that I recorded and it's built in this free plugin called Short Circuit. So basically you can see in the MIDI here, that there's just basically three 16th notes, but we hear more and that's because we have a delay going on too. And the delay has this cool kind of lo-fi EQ thing happening. And the delay also has a stereo tap. So one of these delays is right and the other one is left. This one is set to one eighth notes and this is set to two eighth notes or one eighth note and two eighth notes. That combined with how I have this little sampled instrument routed makes for a really interesting effect because if you watch what happens in the delays, we get this cool kind of broken up stereo delay thing happening. And that's not like a ping pong thing. That's basically just a real simple delay setting and the way that the shaker samples are routed. So the first two are routed to one and two here and the panning is not super extreme. So you can see there is a little bit of stereosity. It's heavy on right and then left. But the third hit here, this guy comes out down here and it's only in one side. And so whenever that note is triggered, it only happens in that side of the delay because the send is not collapsed down to mono. If we look at the send to this, that particular shaker sample, which is short shake comes in and that's being routed to the delay in stereo. See right there. Right here, what we can do is we can collapse this down to mono and then we get this kind of effect. But if we leave it in stereo, it has a little bit more of a spatial kind of thing happening. And so that's pretty much what we have going on through a lot of this 
piece here. Real broken up, simple patterns as we move through the verse. It gets a little bit busier. When I look outside, the second half of the verse, essentially, is a little bit different of a pattern. I see your wonders. When I seek your face, I but it has a really cool sound. Check this out. So we have that going through the entire piece. And another element that I wanted in there was I didn't want to wait the entire time, th this whole long way to bring in some kind of drum element. So I used one of the standard contact drum kits here, and this is band. It's a real tiny one. You can see it only uses up 1.3 megs of memory. And this is kind of a, a cool sounding kit. So I got this kind of thing going on. I'm using an EQ here, so this is what it sounds like without the EQ. So just to give it a little bit of low bump, a little bit of the super lows rolled off, and then a tremendous amount of the highs rolled off to give it that cool lo-fi sound. And then I'm using a compressor with a little bit of auto makeup gain to just give it a little bit more punch and snap. That starts on the interlude here. And then basically goes the same pattern all through the second verse. Then when we get into the chorus, it gets a little bit less busy. Because that's when I start to bring in a little bit of cymbal stuff on the main kind of big drum kit here. So check out what we have going on with all the percussion pieces. And the idea was I didn't, I thought it sounded a little bit too abrupt to bring in these huge drums, just bam, out of nowhere. So I wanted to introduce it real subtly with just a little bit of cymbals, just to give a little bit of high, high stuff in there. And you definitely can hear it. But it's really, really subtle, and I worked the dynamics on there, you can see over here, to make sure that everything was in check, and it, it just sat real nice in the mix. And the drum kit for this is Studio Drummer, which comes in the complete nine package, but you can also buy it separately. And it's this kind of configuration, just a pretty standard six-piece drum kit here with all standard sizes that looks like an 18 inch Tom, but you know, you can read the manual if you want to know for sure. And uh, I think it sounds really great, especially for this song. And to get that big kind of open, what I like to think of as kind of a stadium rock kind of sound um, here in the bridge. You know, that real open kind of room tone. I did a lot of tweaking to the built-in mixer and dynamics for this kit. You know, that has all of these kits come with some mixer presets here. They all sound decent, but not right for this track. So I went through all of them and dialed in the EQ, the compression, the transient dynamic shaper when that was appropriate. And a lot of that sound comes from these three mics here, the overhead stereo, the room stereo microphones, and the overhead mono microphone. to give it that real big sound. There's not a lot of reverb. In fact, if we go over to the reverb bus, don't even really need kick in there. I don't know why that was just left over. Just a tiny amount of it, I mean, you can barely even hear it. Most of that big sound comes from these room mics and how I tweaked them. And that mostly came from the transient shaper, or the transient master dynamics plug in here, which kind of squishes down the transients and can add sustain or can do the reverse where it reduces sustain and kind of beefs up the attack or transients. And so for each one of these, I kind of dialed it in where I thought it was appropriate. So we have the overhead, you know, real aggressive sound there. We have the room mics. 
where it's got a little bit of sustain, but it's more kind of pop and punch to get that big kind of open tone. And then we have just the regular overheads, which these guys are a good bit more sizzly too. And so that's what went into getting this drum sound dialed in. Now for the other stuff, obviously it was built on this finger pick guitar thing. And you can see that it is sliced up a little bit. I had to kind of shift things around here and there to, to get the rhythms to basically just sit just right. Most of it was okay, but you know, there were a few sections that needed to be tweaked up here and there. And to beef this up a little bit more, I found another section that was the same as this chorus. It was probably a, a later chorus here. And then I copied that and put it down here. In fact, yeah, that this guy right here looks like that's the same as here. And so I dragged that down and then I temporarily automated this pan over here so that it goes full left and this guy set to full right so that in this first chorus here to kind of build it out and give it a little bit more depth, we have this kind of stereo finger picking thing. Which I thought sounded really cool. Same thing for these acoustic guitars. They're pretty much just straight up stereo, two separate takes. And they kind of start with this medium kind of strummy thing. And then in the bridge, they build up to a little bit more aggressive strumming. And also the mix is automated so that they get a little bit louder in the mix too. To help kind of with this ambient kind of feel, I did add a pad in here and that's being driven right here by Massive, Native Instruments Massive, which is a fantastic synth. And so that's just using a pad here, a little bit of EQ on there, reduce some of the lows. And it's a real kind of simple pad. You know, to me, this sounds like a pretty standard, you know, this is like the stock pad sound when you think of a pad. Not too many upper resonances, just real ambient, almost like a, an ethereal choir of angels. And then to help with the kind of ambient ethereal nature of this piece, I also did a Rhodes thing and gave it just a whole bunch of reverb. And also some tremolo. And again, this is contact. For a lot of these pieces, I just load up a simple eight instrument preset that I have, which sets up eight stereo outputs and, uh, and loads up a couple of different instruments that I go to a lot. Usually it's piano, drums, organ, bass, strings, pad, and a lead sound, just to get me going really quick when I'm putting together songs and, and arranging. That particular Rhodes sound is not part of the stock contact library. That is the Scarby Vintage Keys, and it's the A200, with a little bit of tremolo on there, because I thought that was appropriate. Got the reverb cranked up pretty good on the actual instrument which is using probably some kind of convolution reverb, I would think. And then also, I'm fairly certain, if I look in the track IO for that guy, I'm also sending it to the verb channel as well, which if we take a look at that really quick, so that's this guy right here, and there's a bunch of stuff being sent to it, little acoustic guitars, cymbal roll, the chocolate drum kit, which is actually the crystal kit, but I named it chocolate because I was trying out that one first and I never renamed it. Shakers are going here too. And this is just using one of the native instruments effects, the RC48. And I kind of dialed in the settings here to, to get it just right. Sometimes I throw in an EQ on there, but this particular reverb has some tone shaping capabilities because I don't like a lot of high sizzly stuff in the reverb. Just that's not, that doesn't jive with me. And I also added some guitars in here too, during the bridge, some electric guitars. And I recorded those myself. These other guitars were recorded by Jeff Parshall, who's the director of the Patmos Music Group, which is who we're doing this EP for, in case you missed that in one of the previous videos. And so I recorded these dry. You can hear if I take off the effects. 
And I did that with my Line 6 Variax. And I usually like to use two different guitar models. So my go-to models that I prefer to use are usually like Les Paul, Telecaster, and Stratocaster. Nothing fancy. And then to drive the amplifier modelers or simulators or whatever you like to call them, I'm using Kuwasa's Amplification 1 which we've looked at in several other tutorials. And I have produced a detailed tutorial on Kuwasa's Amplification 1 for Tuts Plus. So if you want more information on that, you can check that out at tutsplus.com. And I'm using that for both of these guys here with a little bit different setting. One of these kind of has a super high gain setting. This is the lower gain setting. This is the... I mean, it just essentially sounds like noise. Super kind of shrill. But combined, you know, hard right-left pan stereo with this kind of lower gain guitar down here. I thought it had a pretty cool sound, and I was, I was digging the way that that turned out. So those are kind of pretty low in the mix. You know, just some whole notes here in the bridge. You can hear them, but they're definitely buried pretty far back there. And that was the point. You know, I didn't want You know, a lot of a lot of busyness in there. Just trying to keep it real simple. And then one of the main things here that took a pretty good amount of work is this cello here. Right here. So early on when we were recording the vocals for this, I had just kind of thrown it out there that I thought this piece would sound nice with some cello in it, and everyone seemed to agree. So I put a little bit of cello in here, and it seemed appropriate, to me anyway, to have the cello do a little bit of a solo thing in the bridge. And then before and after the bridge, it's pretty much doing a bass line, you know, just playing some whole notes. And to drive this, again, this is uh, in the basic eight contact set here that I have. This is a really cool plugin that I have not covered for Tuts Plus before, and this is the Blakus Cello by Embertone. And it's a really cool sounding kind of emotional cello with real legato transitions, legato bow change, slur legato and portamento legato, as well as some staccato, pizzicato, and tremolo with a variable vibrato and just a whole bunch of cool stuff. Something that I'll cover in more detail in an upcoming tutorial, I'm sure. But that's what drives the cello here is that particular instrument. And so in the beginning here, it's just basically doing bass tones. And normally it would sound a little bit more appropriate to give this a little bit more space, you know, to put a little bit more reverb on it. But in the context of the wetness of the rest of this piece, I thought it worked a little bit better to keep it a little bit more dry and focused sounding. This automation stuff here is for the mod wheel and the expression. You can see here, CC1 is mod wheel, CC11 is expression. And what that's doing is mod wheel is driving the vibrato intensity and the vibrato speed. So these two parameters here, this one is kind of vibrato intensity or how far the pitch gets bent up and down, and this is the speed or the rate of those oscillations. So I linked both of these together so they're both MIDI CC1 because that felt appropriate and it was easy. And those are automated along with the expression just to basically give each note a little bit of shape, a little bit of arc, because without that, it just sounds awful. I mean, it just sounds really canned. It does not sound realistic at all. And to do this, I used a plugin, we don't need to see the log there, called ReControl MIDI, which you can insert here. And this is the MIDI channel, obviously for this, that's linked with contact. And what this does is it gives me some controls here that I can then pull up those controls here in the track envelope automation panel so that I can make those visible and I can edit those. Instead of editing the MIDI CC data, like you would normally do. You know, you'd normally do this kind of thing where you pull up CC1 and then you draw it in. That is incredibly tedious and time consuming. And I don't like it 
because I like to have the curves very smooth and Bezier-like. So what I do is I take these and I set the point shape for all these to Bezier. And then I'll just draw them in by hand. I'll copy and paste a whole bunch of them so that I get kind of the general arc and then maybe I'll tweak a couple of them to give them a little bit more individuality here and there. And that works pretty well for these kind of longer tones here. And it definitely works for this solo stuff here where we're doing different articulations. I'll play a little bit of that for you. So that's a general idea. You know, there is some pretty significant shape to the vibrato. Not a whole lot in the expression for this particular portion because I needed it to be really up there in the dynamics, but there is some shape on almost every single note. There's a little bit of arc, just like you would normally play. You know, if you're digging in with a bow, it starts a little bit softer, gets a little bit louder, then it reduces in intensity as you change the bowing direction and, you know, yada, yada, yada. So just a tiny bit of onibation there. It really didn't take that long. You know, most of it was just drawing a really quick arc and then kind of just tweaking little bits until it sounded right. And that kind of sits pretty nice in the mix here in the middle. It was a little bit tricky to get that to sit right nice in the mix and not compete with the kind of vocal lines that are happening in there. Those kind of what almost sound like ad-libbed vocal lines. So a little bit of balancing act there, but uh, that's pretty much it. And lastly is this bass guitar line here, which is a real live bass guitar. Now I had, and you'll see in several of the other songs when we look at those in some upcoming videos, I had used a contact instrument for the bass. In fact, it was one of the Scarby bass instruments here. Scarby Pre Bass Amped Deep, which is part of the Scarby bass guitar collection. And that sounded okay. The problem was there's not a lot of tone shaping as far as like the pickup selection in some of those. And I'll play a little bit of it for you so you can hear. I think that was actually supposed to be a mute. Although those instruments work for a lot of stuff, they tend to have this kind of mid-range fuzzy, I don't know what you call it, it's kind of a honk, it's kind of like a an overdriven sound on all of them. And that is something that just drives me nuts. For a lot of stuff, it works really great. And I use it for several of the other songs and it works just fine. For this particular song though, that mid kind of honky stuff was not something that I could EQ out without damaging kind of the fundamental frequencies of the bass guitar. And so I found it easier to just record it. And honestly, it just <laughs> took me like 10 minutes to record with my bass. And I have a PV Cirrus bass guitar and it's a fantastic, instrument. It has some of the best sounding pickups that I've ever heard. And, and I usually just leave them uh, panned center between the neck pickup and the bridge pickup. And I find that has a, a really pleasing tone. You can hear what it sounds like completely dry here. There's a tiny bit of string buzz in there because I have the action set super low. But this particular bass guitar uses an active preamp and actually takes two nine volt batteries. The output is very, very hot. I haven't seen another bass with an output as hot as this guitar, which is nice because, you know, I can turn the preamp way down. In fact, I have to use this with the pad button enabled in my audio interface, or I have to run it with the volume knob on the guitar about halfway down because it's so loud that it'll clip with the gain all the way down. I just record it direct and it sounds fine. And then for processing for this guy, really simple kind of stuff here. We have track spacer, retune, which I'm just using as a guitar tuner. <laughs> it's not doing any pitch correction. Uh, you can see the pitch correction is turned off. 
And then a little bit of EQ and a little bit of compression again. You can see there's an unused compressor here. And that's basically because I was A being this as a duck compressor, not a duck quack quack, but a duck get out of the way compressor to use with the kick drum. And we've covered this in other tutorials, but for those of you who don't know, in contact, I have uh, eight instruments and eight stereo returns. You can see they're right here. So I have grand piano, which we're not using, the chocolate kit, cello, drums, a blank one, Rhodes, kick drum, and bass guitar. So most of the drums are here, except kick drum. And you can hear kick drum, but that's not the actual kick mic. The kick mic is right here. And the reason is because I'm using this to send over to the bass guitar channel. And then I'm using track spacer to do kind of a momentary auto equalization of the bass guitar to suck out some of those kick frequencies. Now you can hear the difference between track spacer and recomp, which is just doing a duck. is very subtle. In fact, track spacer is not really doing a whole lot um, because some of this EQ is already kind of making space for the punchy area of the kick drum to sit. So it's a little bit more subtle and I liked what track spacer does a little bit better than you know a standard kind of ducking compressor because you still get the attack of the bass, you get the tones of it because of the controls right here so that it's not EQing anything higher than 184 hertz. So the attack of the note is still there and you hear the pitch of it. But what it is cutting out is the space between 184 and 66 hertz. We could probably back that down to like 44. We can get real aggressive with it. And you can see, you can still hear the, the string attack. We take that off and we do recomp. and we scoot the attack over a little bit, or the release. You're missing that initial string attack. We're here, even with this crank to 100%, you're still getting that nice buzzy string attack in there, which I think is a lot more subtle and it gets the job done in a much nicer way. So I like to use track spacer and that's what's going on there. There's no additional processing applied to this audio return channel. So there you go, I mean, that's pretty much it. That's the instrumentation for this song. They were really happy with what I did to it. I didn't spend a tremendous amount of time. You know, I just put the standard stuff that comes to my mind, you know, some lo-fi drums, some shakers, bass guitar, electric guitars, pads, roads, big sound and drums, you know, that kind of stuff. The vocal is something that we'll get into in an upcoming video. We'll talk about how to coach your singers to get a better performance. That's not something that happened in this particular song because the more I coached, the worse the performance got, and that sometimes can happen. But we'll also talk about kind of vocal processing, retuning stuff. You can see that I'm using Retune, which is a stock plugin that comes with Reaper, and I did all manual pitch correction for this, which was a little bit tedious, but um, it needed it just a little bit. And it may need one or two tweaks. I think I heard one little auto-tune bobble, which I'll have to give one more listen to. But We'll discuss all of that coming up in an upcoming video when we deal with producing the vocals for this piece. And we'll be looking at a couple of different female vocals, a couple of different male vocals, vocal coaching, processing, plugins. But I did wanna give you a little bit of flavor and insight into what went into producing just one of these songs as far as the instrumentation. We'll look at a little bit of the other songs, what went into the instrumentation and orchestration of those when we get into kind of mixing and automating and that kind of stuff, but we won't go through, you know, kind of line by line like we did in this video. So I hope you found that interesting and I hope you found a few things that you can use in your own projects that will help you along the way in your musical journey. Make sure you check out some of the next videos in this series where we'll be looking at producing vocals. We're gonna be checking out some of the mixing and automation that goes into a few of these songs 
and we'll be exploring a little bit more of the arrangement and orchestration instrumentation in those a little bit as well. A ton of stuff coming up in the next few videos in this series. Thanks so much for checking out this video. Again, my name is Dave Bodie for Tut Plus, and we'll see you around. Thanks for watching.